Let's take a look at another contour diagram, a more complicated one than the last one, and see if you can identify the global min, or sorry, local mins and maxes and saddle points, as well as the global max and global min, at least on the domain shown. So going back to our earlier unit, looking at the boundaries and the critical points. All right. So I'll ask you to take a moment and see if you can identify the critical points and their types here from the contour diagram and see how that works out to start with. All right, pause if you need a little more time. All right, we'll get started. So by far, the easiest critical points to identify are those at the center of Oh, there's another one there at the center of concentric contours. And we can classify them a bit better here. Let's do green X's for local maxima. And again, what we're looking for is especially the last few contours, 13, 14, 15, up to 16. That's going uphill to a max. 9, 10, 11. That's a local max. This one here, local max, 9, 10, 11. Here, let's do these in blue big circles in blue, uh, 765 going down, local min going down, local min. So we have a nice categorization here. And blue circles are local min. What about saddle points? Well, if I look at this diagram, I don't actually see any crossings of the contour lines. There's no yeah, there's no place where these things cross. This is very typical. You'll also notice we don't have a contour at the peaks, right? Those we know are there just because of the structure of the surface. And we know, okay, if it's going up a hill and uphill and uphill, somewhere in there has to be a maximum or minimum in this case here for these two blue circles. Oops, I've missed one. Uh, nine, eight, this one's a little trickier. 10, nine, eight, this is actually another minimum in this point at the center here just based on the closest contours to it. But we'll notice that we don't see a dot there in the contour diagram because the height doesn't happen to match exactly the values that we picked for our contours, like 12 here. This height's probably somewhere between 11 and 12, so it doesn't show up visibly. The same is true for our saddle points. The contours we pick here at nice integer values don't happen to show the uh, saddle lines. However, we know that they, they're going to have to be there, especially if we think of, say, the transition between these two, uh, these several two curves here. As we go from one max to another max, and there's two mins over here. Well, if I imagine walking from this minimum over to this minimum, I would go up and up and up and up. There'll be some transition, and then I'll go down again. Likewise, starting at this peak, I'll go down, down, down and then have to go back up again. So somewhere in between here, we expect that there's going to be a saddle point. Well, where would that happen? Well, imagine the height of eight here, height of eight here, and this is nine. Well, there's gonna be some contour, say that's, I don't know, eight and a half, which is an expansion of this contour. So we have that. There might be another one just beside it, also at eight and a half and then they might cross or touch here before going on to the various other sides that we have. Actually, it's probably better to draw like this. Eight and a half might be this height here. And then what it'll do is cross somehow with the contours coming out of this diagram, out of this peak. And so somewhere around here, we expect there's going to be some kind of saddle point. Now, is that the only one? Well, I don't think so. We've got the same kind of configuration between this maximum and maximum and this minimum and minimum. So there's probably another one in this neck of the woods for the same reasons. And maybe another one over here. Actually, there probably is because we've got downhill and back uphill, downhill and downhill. It's actually gets pretty subtle to identify saddle points from a contour diagram. Let me show you the final picture. Uh, to give you some idea. Here is the contour diagram with the levels of the saddle points added. So there's a height here, blue, where we do get a saddle point, pretty much where we expected there. 
we see there's another saddle point over here. And yeah, there was one over here as well. So the transitions between peaks where there's valleys on either side, it's very common to have a saddle point there. We're going to see throughout this or towards the end of this unit that we can get pretty exotic uh, combinations for other surfaces if we do them right. But this is a typical kind of layout of maxima, minima, minima here, minimum here, and maxima here, maximum here, and the transition between the valleys and between the peaks ending up being saddle points. That's a very common construction of surfaces and very common layout for critical points on those surfaces. Now, last but not least, we were actually asked to identify not only the local max and mins and critical points in general, but to identify the global max and min. So just a reminder, in this type of scenario where we have a closed and bounded domain, the global max will occur in one of two places, on the boundary or at an interior critical point. So the global max or min occurs, occurs on the boundary or at an interior critical point. And I think from the heights along the boundary, it's pretty clear we've got heights around eight to seven, eight to nine. These heights are much lower than the height of this peak here at 16 or a little bit above 16. We would have the global maximum there. And if we look for minima, there were three minima we could select between. There was one down here as well. And that minimum certainly is lower than those two because the contours associated with it go down to height two. So this would be below height two. This would be the single global min on the domain that's shown here. Maybe it goes lower outside this domain, we don't know, but certainly on this rectangular domain, this point here is where the value of the, the function takes on its lowest possible value. So again, critical point analysis, the point of it is to focus our attention. We know if we're looking for global max and min on a region that we have to consider the boundary, but how would I figure out which point is absolutely the lowest on this whole domain? Well, there's an infinite number of points on here, right? How do I pick them? Ah, we're guaranteed that the minimum, if it's inside the region, is going to occur only at a critical point. So if we're looking for our mins and maxes, global mins and maxes, we just have to look at the local mins, look at the local maxes. We could look at the saddle points, but we know they're not going to be the most extreme values because of their dual min in one direction, max in another. Uh, but they are things that are going to potentially confuse us as we do this analytically. They're going to be points that show up in our calculations of, of critical points. And then we just have to be able to recognize that they're saddles, throw them away, and focus our attention on the mins and maxes if what we're interested in is the largest possible value or the smallest possible value of the function.